So we were transferring money into our account from Canada to buy a house. And then we got our bank statement and noticed that there was a $20,000 fee. Hey, Gen Max, that story, totally true. <laughs> that is totally not Michelle, though. She got cold feet. She didn't want to be talking smack about her bank. But I thought this was really important for you to hear the message that she had to share. And so what I've done is I had a friend uh, pretend to be Michelle. So that's who you, who you just heard from. And now we're going to go and talk to Bernardo from Actonver Bank. You know, Actonver is one of the banks that I bank with and also a sponsor of this channel. So Bernardo came to La Paz. He's normally in their San Jose office, but he had some business to do in La Paz. And so I got him to come by Esquina out in El Centenario. And we had a, a brief talk. Now, I got to apologize in advance, and I swear this is the last time this is going to happen, but the audio for the video is not good. And this is the same microphone that I used for the other audio that wasn't good. And if you can't put up with the audio, I'm going to give you the message. The key message is do not assume that your bank is going to do the right thing by you because you know what happens when you assume you make an ass out of you and me and you make your banker really, really rich. So let's go ahead and meet Bernardo down at Esquina in La Paz. Hi, I'm Bernardo Gonzalez. I'm here to help you out with banking in Mexico. Okay, so let's just jump right in, Bernardo. What happened with Michelle? Because this isn't the only person. I actually, right before making this video, I came across another person, Sue, who said she lost more than $40,000 uh, eight years ago on an exchange rate type of thing. So this is not everyone runs into this, but it's relatively common in that I've heard it twice within the past month. It's a very common mistake when people send U.S. dollars or other currency into Mexico and the currency gets changed in there, meaning that they give the responsibility to the bank to exchange the currency and to receive the pesos down here, so you don't control the exchange rate. The best uh, way to go on these type of uh, transactions will be to send U.S. dollars to Mexico and then wait for a better exchange rate, or that you have your, your bank uh, in the States or your homeland uh, get exchanged the, to exchange the U.S. dollars into pesos and send them over here, because you you will never know what a change rate you get. Uh, yes, and also from my uh, early years as a realtor, I realized that people is very, uh, very excited to make the transaction, to buy the land, to buy the property in Mexico, and they just, you know, send the money, don't care, whatever. And once they look at the back and they see they went in through uh, into different costs that they shouldn't went into, like the exchange rate or transfer fees or uh, whatever happened in there, right? So take a moment to think, ask your realtor, ask your banker what you... What can you do to get it better? And uh, you get a better rate. Anyway. Yeah, this is something uh, when Michelle first told me her story, I said, well, boy, I didn't. I mean, it's been four years since we bought our house. I wonder what happened with us. Um, and so we'll talk more about that in terms of how real estate transactions work. But I found a fee of $500 from Bank of America that they charged us uh, like a foreign transaction fee. It should have just been a $45 international wire fee to get the money to the bank. And actually, I, yeah, I think it was a bank in Mexico, but it was going to be in dollars because it's possible to have dollar accounts in Mexico. We'll talk a little bit about that. And so I don't know what that fee was. It's been four years, so I'm not going to get it back now. And actually, Michelle did try to get her money back, asked them if they would just exchange it right back to Canadian dollars. And they were like, nope, 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 uh, too late. So let's talk a little bit more uh, about other ways maybe that you can transfer the money. So really start to dig in a little bit. And this is something you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, there's probably a million ways this could happen. And so definitely do your research. And probably the, the biggest thing I'm going to, your takeaway for this video is going to be find out exactly what is happening with the bank and with the exchange. Because as Bernardo said, you know, we're all super excited. We went back and forth negotiating over, you know, a few thousand US dollars or something. And then we ended up with a $500 fee. And, and Michelle, I'm not sure if she negotiated, but she ended up with, with $20,000. That, that's a big chunk of change. So let's find out other ways or kind of, you know, looking at banks or other ways to get money into Mexico. Well, yes, normally in Mexico, you will have a U.S. dollar account in your bank as long as you're holding more than $100,000. So um, maybe 50, 60, 60% of Mexican banks can offer you a U.S. dollar account. So the best way to go or the best way I advise you to go is that you can send U.S. dollars into your U.S. dollar account in Mexico and then wait for an exchange rate that is proper for you to, to make it, uh, to exchange it into pesos and to use the pesos. Yeah. 
So there's also other ways like uh, platforms like WISE, like Cell, like NX or different platforms that you can use. Uh, so you can see the exchange where you're getting and you can send pesos directly to your Mexican account in pesos, okay? So there's these two different ways. Uh, it really depends on you, but just take a moment, uh, ask for it, and uh, see what's going on around the transaction every time you do. Yeah, I use WISE. That's how I send money back and forth. And it seems to be probably the biggest way that people move money from a U.S. bank to their Mexican bank. WISE is a great service. They're very clear on the fees. So I don't know them off the top of my hand, but they give you the mid-market rate. So that's the rate, like if you go on to google.com, uh, that's the exchange rate you're going to get minus a you know a percent or something in fees. And other banks, though, a lot of banks that actually cater to expats, cater to foreigners, they don't charge fees, and that's how they sell their accounts, but then they kill you on the exchange rate, and it's a way of hiding the fees, and I really don't like that. There's different ways to do it, and some of those ways, like WISE, are really clear about what you're getting charged. Otherwise, if it's not super clear, ask your bank. I have a Ban Norte account here, so it's just a Mexican bank. We don't have enough money in there to have a dollar account, and when we sent our money, actually, when we were doing the transaction, we'll talk a little bit about if dollars, if houses sell in dollars versus pesos versus Canadian dollars. So I'm going to ask Bernardo to chat a little bit about that because he's been in the real estate world too. Probably you get a price in dollars for the property you're buying in Mexico, right? That's, that's the way the properties are listed. But for the Mexican government, uh, the, the, the amount in Mexican pesos needs to be registered. So you might be requested to pay the, the property in pesos or pay the property in dollars. So... Whatever, whatever is the request that you have, uh, the the most e the easiest way to do it is to send your currency into Mexico, whether it's U.S. dollar or Canadian dollar, and then get an exchange when the exchange rate is good for you. Okay. So if the payment is requested in U.S. dollars, you can send them directly to the realtor from the states, or you can send them first to your account in Mexico and then pay the realtor in Mexico. So I've noticed that most of the houses here, like um, if you go over to our realtor's office, which is just around the corner here, you'll see the prices listed in U.S. dollars. Very common if people are selling a house, if they're selling it for specifically for the gringo market, they might be selling it that way. Or if they are a foreigner and they want to get dollars out of the transaction, they're listed in dollars. So pretty common, but not all the time. As with Michelle, she was paying a Mexican builder. So she was paying in pesos. Or if it's a Mexican seller, they're going to want pesos. So it's not always, this problem doesn't always present itself. Of course, there were the extra fees, like the $500 fee. So for me, we were paying in dollars. The seller was actually getting Canadian dollars out of the transaction. So that was a, another level. So they had to go through another transaction uh, to transfer from US dollars to Canadian dollars. So you got to watch for the exchange rate there too, because I'm sure they wanted every penny they could get. But um yeah, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the Canadian dollar aspect of this. Well, for Canadian dollars, uh, there's um, just a very few banks in Mexico that receive Canadian dollars, so you will need to have to do this change in the air, how we call it. That's that being said, is the exchange need to be done before getting to Mexico, so you're going to receive pesos, and then if you need to pay U.S. dollars, you need to convert your pesos into U.S. dollars again. Yeah, so. In any case, what you want to do is tie up the exchange rate. Before you send the money, you you tie up with your bank what is the exchange rate right now for my Canadian dollars and what will be for my U.S. dollars. And you can tie up the two transactions in one same uh, in one same call, right? But uh, if you just leave it to the banks, banks uh, normally see exchange rate as a business. Uh, we in Actinver, we see exchange rate as a service right now because our business is into uh, investing and into helping people make some yield on their money. So we're not looking to make 40, 50 cents of the exchange rate like, like, like it normally happens with uh, commercial banks. So I mentioned earlier that there are some banks who don't, that make a lot of money off their exchange rate and hide that fact. And uh, Intercam and uh, Bank of Mifel, which I've talked about in the past, are, you know, they provide great customer service because it's all in English, it's all set up, uh, that their websites are in English, everything is wonderful, except they do make money off the exchange rate and I just wish they were a lot more honest about that upfront. And sometimes if you've got small transactions, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it's worth getting uh, your banker to speak in English for that small fee. But when you're talking about a real estate transaction, this could be a really big fee. Let's talk about, say your bank, Intercam, for instance, is notorious for saying you cannot use WISE. And there's other services out there too. But let's just focus on WISE, talk about how you could get your money into any account in Mexico 
any of your accounts in Mexico using a service like Wise, which is very clear and usually a pretty good deal. Uh, when you're making a transaction or a wire transfer with a platform uh, outside of Mexico, uh, you'll be requested uh, whether to use a clave, which is an 18-digit number you get in Mexico, or whether it's a SWIFT code, that every bank should have a SWIFT code. So when you request a SWIFT code, you will be requested a SWIFT code plus your account number, uh, and you request a clave, you can just send your money to this 18-digit number, okay? But uh, the platform should recognize the account and should be able to send uh, the pesos into the account you're putting there. Uh, what might be a problem is you're receiving a third-party payment uh, through a platform. Like, let's say John sends money to Brighton, uh, so the Mexican financial system might block that transfer because it is a third-party transfer, and Mexican regulation is really into money laundering uh, rules, you know? So well, uh, if it's, uh, as long as it, it comes from your same account, wise, uh, sell, whatever, into your Mexican account to your same name, there shouldn't be any trouble to do it. And I think WISE does have a limit of $50,000 per transfer or something. So they're not going to get, you know, it's going to be a little bit hard to make that transfer for a house. But XE.com, um, which is listed below, it's actually a, and, and I'm affili an affiliate with them. I just haven't been promoting them just yet. But they will allow you to send more money. I think there's maybe a $300,000 limit or something like that. But they do require that SWIFT code. And that's a little bit less obvious in Mexican banks. Like all the international banks use a SWIFT code. Mexican banks do have a SWIFT code. They just, you know, everybody knows. I mean, if you pull up your app and you'll find your um, your Clave number. And that's really used very often for making transfers from one person to the next. It's how I will pay my cleaners or my pool guy or something like that. So those interbank transfers are really pretty common in Mexico. And I'm going to do a video solely about that because that really freaks out some people when they first get here. The, it, uh, the way people pay uh, each other is different in Mexico, very secure, but just feels a little weird. You can, even with Intercam, if you go into the app, you will find your Clave and you'll be able to send money to them. They just don't like it because it's how they make money. Also, Wise sometimes doesn't have the best customer service. XE does have better customer service. So something to think about if you're making those large money transfers. So let's talk a little bit more about exchange rates. Uh, I was like, oh, let's do an example here where we get like the, um, the Intercam exchange rate off the internet and we compare it to the Actonver exchange rate. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute, I've tried this before. Intercam doesn't publish their rates. You gotta call them and get the rates and you have to be a customer and stuff like that. So once again, they hide that stuff a little bit. But let's hear more about exchange rates. Well, yeah, the uh, banking business is a spread business, okay? So there's always a spread being charged, what if it's a yield or a rate or a exchange rate, okay? So I, I, we, just, we just changed the exchange rate right now, and it's uh, 1706. Uh, and if you're making an operation with Active Bear right now, you're probably getting 1702, 1703, 1701, depending on what we get from the central. But uh, as it is a spread business, you can see the cost of the operation uh, in, in the screen, right? As a banker. You see the cost of the operation, uh, you translate uh, to your customer how much it's going to cost, your customer accepts the transaction, and then you go for it. Uh, but uh, at any case, uh, we need the, the, the authorization from the customer to make the transaction. So you can always check the exchange rate in your phone, check what your bank is giving you, and if it looks fair to you, then make the transaction. If not, just wait for a few minutes or an hour till the exchange rate is better or just negotiate with your banker. Now, that's not something I've ever heard is the thought of negotiating with a banker, but I guess if you're transferring a lot of money and you can get, you know, one centavo more, that, that might uh, make a difference. And they're still going to make, there's just a tiny bit less spread, but they're still making a lot of money. A lot of us, uh, I know Kiru Paul does it, I do it, you know, watch the exchange rate so we can pick the proper day to send a transfer through WISE or through XE or something like that. The big question I always have is, it's kind of like the stock market. How do you know when the exchange rate is good or when the exchange rate is bad? Because no one can predict where it's going in the future. So I always, you know, I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to wait till it gets back up above 20 because that was the exchange rate a while ago. And it's not getting anywhere near 20 for, you know, probably a couple of years. But how do we know if like t today, um, as Bernardo said, it's 17.06, should we... You know, if, if we need the money within one week to make our, our payments to our contractor, how do we know if we should jump on 1706 or if we should wait for that 17.2? Yes, exchange rate is offer and demand, like the stock market, like you say. So when the exchange rate is going down, it means that there is a high demand for pesos, okay? So right now, people is wanting people are, is wanting a lot of pesos and the peso is getting some volume. 
So the best moment to exchange them is when there's a reverse on the on the price. Uh, we don't know when it's going to happen. Of course, there's been two years and a half that the, the peso uh, has make uh, uh, has gained against the U.S. dollar. But we have these spikes uh, during the week or during the month when there is a Fed uh, conference, when there is a Banco de Mexico conference, when there's a decision on the rates. And we will probably see a better exchange rate in the next months as Mexico, Banco de Mexico, uh, rise the rates, uh, reference rates in Mexico as well. So uh, don't desperate, don't get desperate on the exchange rate. You might get a better rate uh, in the near future. Uh, and in the meantime, you can make some percentage or some yield on your dollars also in Mexico. Okay, so Bernardo is talking about working with Actinver, which is an investment bank. So they're looking to maximize the amount of money they have invested for you. You can probably find other other banks that will give you some advice on the exchange rate. And I'm not quite sure how common that is. You can also look online at either Peso Futures or Peso Forecasts. And it's interesting, though, there are websites who will kind of predict which way it's going to go. And, you know, they're using some of the same information that Bernardo's using in terms of like, oh, this, there's a big meaning on this date. It's likely to become more volatile, something like that. So it is possible to uh, try to time the market. You can see like, okay, what's the long term trend? It's going up or it's going down. I need to buy pesos now or I should wait. So I've already mentioned Banca Mifel and Intercam um, maybe are, you know, not the best at the exchange rate. But like I said, there's other reasons you might want to bank with a bank. Um, but I have heard really good things about Santander that in the morning, if you uh, call them, you'll get a really good rate. Uh, my realtor said almost as good as, as wise. Um, so there are some banks that do better than others. Um, and also, I think in my other video, I talked about if like HSBC was the worst ATM machine that you could go to, if you're not an HSBC customer, they charge you a lot. So maybe if you're an HSBC customer, it's perfectly fine. So once again, do your research for your individual situation, especially when you're transferring a large amount of money. But let's talk more about some other banks uh, and why you might choose one over the other. Uh, the best way to manage payments or manage cash in Mexico is to have a Mexican bank. Uh, so you can own uh, a debit card and you can get money in any ATM you like. Some of them has fees, some of them they don't. But you want to have your money in pesos to exchange uh, to spend in pesos, right? So let's say you're in a restaurant and you pull up your U.S. car or your Canadian car and you get charged uh, and you get a stage rate from the restaurant or from the card holder, uh, then you will get ripped off with, with the stage rate, right? Because you're leaving that to someone else. Uh, in the other uh, sense, if you have your dollars in Mexico, you just change, let's say, 20,000 pesos for, for one month. So you have your 20,000 pesos in your Mexican account. So you can go on and spend 20,000 pesos exactly and you're not going to get uh, ripped in uh, whether the exchange rate or in the fees or nothing because you're getting peso to peso. Okay? So if you're getting charged in dollars, then you can pay with your dollar account. But if normally 90% of places in Mexico, you get charged in pesos. So try using your Mexican account uh, to pay for pesos. Uh, my advice is not to bring so much cash. Uh, I have seen customers coming with $5,000 in cash. Then they want to get a good exchange rate on the street, and it's really not because we need to transport the cash. So it's really expensive to manage cash. So the best way is always to send dollars into your dollar account and then get the best exchange rate from your advisor in Actimba and then also spend on the street. And WISE is, I, it kind of operates like a bank. I don't quite understand it, but you can keep your money in accounts at WISE. So I actually just recently used up all my pesos at WISE because I had transferred, I had put dollars in, I had a dollar account, I have a peso account. Um, and when the exchange rate was really good, I put a bunch of money into the peso account and then I've been taking it out. Um, so working through that money and now it's gone and now I have to accept whatever the exchange rate is, what I need money. But I put those pesos into my local account. I get out cash because... Mexico is a very cash-based place, so I don't have, uh, I have a debit card I use to go to the ATM machine, but I also have, you know, something to think about, this is talking about smaller transactions now, but if you uh, use your U.S. credit card, you may have a credit card that has foreign transaction fees or one that doesn't have foreign transaction fees, so make sure you, you know about that, and I think if it's a Visa card, you get a decent rate plus a little bit of a fee, so check your fine print in your credit cards or your debit cards from back home. Also, uh, Bernardo mentioned paying in pesos versus dollars. Yeah, ideally, you always want to have the transaction go through in pesos because then your bank back home, which has a little bit more your interest in mind, is the one that's going to set the transaction rate. But if you, like at an ATM machine, tell it to accept the, uh, the rate, 
it's going to go through in dollars, and the bank in Mexico is going to make a lot of money off that transaction if you're not their customer. Yeah, so that's kind of, I think the, the, the things that we're, we've got coming out of this video is, you know, store your money somewhere where it's easy to move it over into the other currency at a good exchange rate when you know it's a good exchange rate or when it's an uh, exchange rate that you like. And also really know those numbers, because if you don't know the numbers, they could be ugly numbers. Um, so uh, question the bank, get the information, have them write it out, have them tell you what the fees are going to be, what's really going to go through, what's really going to happen. Because if you don't know, they, they might be taking advantage of the situation. And also, uh, you need to find out how to make money while you make this change. Okay, so... Uh, right now, here in Baja, we're the only ones that give you a yield on your dollars while you wait for a good exchange rate, right? If you wait in a 48-hour liquidity, you're making from 3 to 4%, but there's also some FX notes that you're looking for a higher strike, and you're getting paid for the risk to get a change, right? So let's say you want a 1715 exchange rate. Right now, it's 1706, so the bank decides that it's going to pay you a 10 or 11% rate for the risk of, of uh, the exchange rate, so you're going to make a very nice yield. Uh, before getting a change. If it doesn't get a change, so you still get a yield uh, and you wait to the next round to get a change. So there, uh, all over Mexico, some investment banks offer uh, investment in US dollars, but in Baja, we're the only ones that do that right now. And that's actually a good point about WISE. Like I left all that money sitting there that you know, I'd probably, I transferred over to pesos, so I'd gotten a good exchange rate, but I wasn't making any money off my money. And you know, as in the other video with Bernardo, you could make up to 11% right now um, in a CD in Mexico. And, and if you're working with a bank that pays interest, like I said, not wise, XE won't let you keep your money there uh, for any you know large amount of time and they don't pay you interest when you're kind of storing your money there. That's probably part of how they make money is encouraging people to store money with them that they're not paying interest on so they're able to use that money. So I mentioned our house that we bought four years ago. We bought it from a Canadian seller. It was listed in dollars. So we bought it in dollars. They got paid in, in uh, Canadian. But there were a lot of people and a lot of fees that were still in pesos. So let's uh, have Bernardo talk a little bit about that. Okay, well, by regulation in Mexico, uh, all the fees will be charged in pesos. Uh, sometimes they're converted into dollars for international customers to understand them. But you might want to ask all the parties involved, what are the fees in pesos since the beginning of the, of, of the transaction, yeah? Don't wait till the end. It's also like, like your banker or like the exchange rate. You want to know everything crystal clear from the beginning. How much is the notary charging in pesos? How much is the realtor charging in pesos? How much is everyone working for you uh, charging in pesos? Because when the transaction comes, then the peso might fluctuate and they, want, they might want more dollars from your side. And you're not going to come up with that or you're going to feel unsatisfied with the, with the operation, right? So try seeing all, all the parties in pesos, what are you going to pay for and how much everyone's going to receive. Then you can, you can have those pesos uh, uh, put away so you can pay for all the fees. Actually, that's, that's a good point is like when you're paying for something in pesos, uh, if, it's, if you know something, an expense is coming up, getting the money into your account at a favorable exchange rate is important. And actually, that, I'm remembering now Sue, who lost like 40,000 Canadian dollars in her transaction. It was essentially the exchange rate had changed a lot from when maybe they were supposed to close to when they actually closed because things got delayed. And that's what caused that huge difference. So had she gone ahead and put the money, transferred her Canadian dollars into a peso account in Mexico, um, then she would have had the proper amount of pesos. But they waited and the exchange rate changed in the meantime. And sometimes it'll change in your favor and sometimes it'll change away. So it's really about how much risk that you want to take. But getting the money over into pesos when you feel comfortable with the number, with uh, the exchange rate, is probably always a good idea. So I'm going to do one more video about uh, real estate transactions and about Canadian versus US dollars and how pesos gets in there too and capital gains. The real quick story is the people that sold us our house, who were Canadian, sold it for the exact same amount in Canadian dollars that they bought it for. However, the exchange rate, the Mexican peso had dropped by 50%. So they owed capital gains of on 50% of the money, even though they hadn't made any money in Canada, they'd made a lot of money in Mexico. So I'm going to go into a detailed video about that. If that one's ready, um, you'll see it at the end of this video. But uh, let's uh, hear a little bit more about from Bernardo about Actinver, because you know we've talked about that as a good bank to do these transactions with. 
and they have offices around Mexico. So let's just get to understand this particular bank a little better. I'm in charge of the whole expat strategy of Activa. So I take care of expats living in Mexico. So if there is any doubts or any uh, thing you need help with banking in Mexico, let us know. Uh, we can help you out. Uh, we go from exchange rates to investment to transactional banking. Uh, we have an app in English for you guys, so you can also make your payments in Mexico. And um, we invite you to, uh, to stop using that much cash because I know you guys use a lot of cash. So your transaction apps are also, a lot, or are also registered and um, also people receiving your cash is paying taxes on the operation you're doing. Okay? So uh, whether if it's for transactional, uh, private banking, investment, uh, we can help you out. We understand our business and we understand you guys. Uh, we know you might feel lost when it comes to banking in Mexico. Uh, it is a whole new world and uh, it is a regulation. Uh, it is a regulation trap world. Sometimes you can be three hours in a line and not get things done in the bank. Been there, done that. Uh, have the confidence to let us know. We'll help you out with your bank. Well, thank you guys for watching. Thank you, Bernardo, for sharing your knowledge. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing your rather painful story. And if I've got other videos, I got one with Bernardo up, up, up here about getting about 11% uh, interest rate on a CD down in Mexico. And also uh, another video that's going to be perfect for you if I've got that other one telling the story of how the sellers had to pay capital gains on 50%. That one will be down here. I'll see you in the next video. Hasta luego. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs>